be verse 6. So there you know what uh, the subject matter that lies ahead. And if you've been reading the second chapter and following the verses each week, you pretty much know what lies ahead. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5, verse we're working on. I like to read 4 and 5 together. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. And we're going to look at another but God tonight. And hath raised us, uh, verse 5, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. We began looking at that phrase there, that uh, f phrase in parentheses there last week. By grace, ye are saved. We want to do some more work on it this week. But we said the word grace is 122 times in the New Testament. I believe it's 102 times in Paul's writings. He liked the word grace, brethren. And 12 times, if I'm not mistaken, in the book of Ephesians alone, 12 times. So we began looking at grace last week, and we said we weren't going to read all the scriptures associated with grace where it's used and so forth, but we read uh, four passages. Remember the book of Acts, chapter 15, and... Verse 11, which told us, uh, through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the 18th chapter, in, in verse uh, 27, he said, uh, He helped them much which had believed through grace. And then Romans chapter 3 and Verse 24, and we'll be looking at those verses in Romans, the third chapter, again tonight, but justified freely by his grace. And then in chapter 4 and verse 16, we'll be in chapter 4 tonight, Lord willing. It is of faith that it might be by grace. Amen. Now, if that's not an indication to you that faith is grace, then I don't know how much plainer we got to get for you to understand that faith is not your faith. It's grace. It's a gift. It's given to you by Almighty God. So we looked at those verses last week and those phrases. We saw that grace was abundant according to uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. And that word abundant uh, means superabound. It superabounds. Uh, and, and certainly, keep that thought in your mind because we're going we're gonna to be de dealing more uh, with this thought maybe even next week as we get into verse 6 and, and thinking about grace and it uh, abounding and it superabounding and well, just a wonderful, glorious topic. But the, verse 21 of the same chapter of Romans chapter 5 said that grace reigns. <laughs> where, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound, and grace reigns. You see, grace reigns king. Where, where God sends his grace, it reigns, it rules in the life of an individual. And that's where we left off last week. We didn't get to the fact that grace opposes works. Grace, did you know grace opposes works? Well, we'll be dealing with that some tonight in, in uh, chapter 4 when we, when we look at chapter 4 of Romans again. But turn with me to the 11th chapter of the book of Romans. And, and like... Like I've said before, I know, know you all know this, but, but just 
Follow along. Even though you know it, follow along. Because, you know, I get all excited when I'm over there studying it. <laughs> and then I get excited again when I'm standing here proclaiming it. But Romans chapter 11, verse 6, And if by grace, then is it no more of works. You see, he's proceeding to tell us that it can't be by both. <laughs> it's one or the other. <laughs> and God said it's grace. Amen. He said it was a gift. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. <laughs> you see, they're, they're, they're opposed to one another. Work says, I earned it. I deserve it. Grace says, you don't deserve it, but I'm giving it to you. You see. And that was me. I don't know about you, but that was me. I didn't, I didn't deserve God's favor. I didn't deserve God's goodness. Still don't. <laughs> Still don't. But thank God. God loves me. And his grace is there. And well, as we're going to see tonight, all my sin are gone. G-O-N-E. Gone. Brother Mike, I don't think you ever sing that song, do you? No. I don't know. Is it in the book? It's not in the book? Well, we'll have to do something, we'll have to do something about that and teach it to, to the children. Brother Jesse, does your children know, know that song? Uh, Praise God, my sins are gone. G-O-N-E, gone. <laughs> What? Yes, my sins are gone. Yes, my sins are gone. You see, now. Yeah, yeah. Now there's a song in my heart or something like that. So anyhow. So grace opposes works. It can't be by both, and we have those who want to mix it. Yeah, it, and they'll say, yeah, it's by grace, but you got you to do this. You, yeah, it's by grace, but you got to be baptized. Whatever. You see, that, that baptism is a work. The same as, well, and we're going to see it tonight in Romans chapter 4 again. Same as circumcision was a work. Was Abraham justified? Was, was, was faith in Imputed, credited to him for righteousness before circumcision or while he was yet in uncircumcision, you see? We'll answer that question later on. Not only that, grace is given to us. Well, <laughs> we just said grace is a gift, so it's given. You see, we humans are really fickle. We give gifts sometimes. But most generally, well, of course, I heard, of, heard somebody say something about this. Uh, the season just passed. Uh, time of gift giving. Give, give gifts to, to you, people that you don't like. And they get gifts that they don't want, <laughs> something, something to that effect. <laughs> well, you know, but generally our gifts are, are to, to one another based on love and affection for them. And, and yes, even though we may love them, If we are all the time giving them a gift and they're never giving us a gift, we say, well, to Harry with you, you ain't getting one from me no more. Right? That's the way we do it. Sure we do. 
God didn't get nothing from us. We had nothing to give him. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Grace is given to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Christ Jesus. Does that sound like these saints worked for anything? <laughs> no. It was the grace of God which was given to them. God gave it to them. They didn't work for it, do anything for it. And of course, as you already surmised when we get down to verse 8, we'll be dealing with this thought even some more. Verses 8 and 9 and 10. Grace, grace is everything for what? For nothing. For nothing. Grace is everything for nothing. What did you give back to God? We can't, we can't even, we can't even obey Him like we ought to. So grace is all for nothing. Grace gives us salvation. Complete salvation. Grace is, is help. For the helpless. It is hope for the hopeless. We were without hope. We were helpless. Now, 20, almost 23 years of my life, I went along thinking I was pretty sufficient. I was doing pretty good. Until grace came. And I was without hope. I was in despair. And I was helpless to help myself. And I knew it. <laughs> I'll never forget that day. I don't want to forget that day. I, I mean, yes, even though it was 43 years ago, almost 44 years ago, I, I remember it just like it. It was this morning. I was miserable. You know, I, my wife will tell you, I'm the type of person that you can look in, into my face and my eyes and it tells the whole story. <laughs> and knowing that about me, and I know that so, Knowing that about me, I, I wonder how, how many people at the shop that day, at the factory that day, thought something's wrong with him. Because I tell you, I was miserable. God is working me over. God, you, you got to save me. My sins are great, and there's nothing I can do about it. 
I've tried to stop this. I've tried to stop that. I've tried to be a good fellow. I can't. That's a miserable place to be. <laughs> but it's a delightful place to be. God was working on me. And that was good. <laughs> and he didn't leave me there. <laughs> a peace came over my heart <laughs> when Jesus said, I paid it all. Amen. My blood's sufficient. Boy, <laughs> that's shouting ground. <clears throat> Turn with me to the uh, book of Romans chapter 5. Book of Romans chapter 5. Verse 6. For when we were yet without strength. We had no strength. I used to boast of my strength. I was strong as an ox. I had strength in my legs. And I could get under a 300 pound drum and I could lift it up from the floor. I could bench 300 pounds on the, in the weight room. That's just my arms. But that day I was without strength. That is, I had no strength to help myself in the condition that I was in, and you didn't either. And if you're still in that condition, you don't either. I had no ability. I was unable to do anything for myself. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's every ungodly person there without strength. And Ephesians 2 and verse 12 said, Furthermore, we were without hope. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. And without God in the world. Those who are without God, those who are ungodly, they have no strength, they have no ability, and they have no hope. They're in a hopeless condition. Yeah. Praise God, I'm not there anymore. I still don't have any strength of my own. The strength I have is... Christ Jesus and my hope is in him you see grace grace takes our unrighteousness and gives us his righteousness Brother France says, he, he took my sins and he gave me his righteousness. He swapped. He swapped it. <laughs> yes. Praise God. Oh, and I left this off. Which we do not deserve. He took my unrighteousness Gave me his righteousness. I didn't deserve that. <clears throat> Ever since that day, I would have told you that day that I didn't deserve it, and every day since then I've told you I didn't deserve it.
Now, turn with me to the third chapter of Romans. This passage of scripture that we're about to read spells this thought out better than, well, it makes it so plain, I think. You can't get any plainer than this. And I don't... <laughs> If I was standing up here and I was reading this passage of Scripture, or if I was sitting in my office and I was reading this passage of Scripture and I was Armenian, I would change my position. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, he tells you what a wretch you are. It parallels with Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. Dead in trespasses and sins. That is the condition he portrays here. He shows him a vile, wretched, stinking, filthy man. And he says, you're all that way. Every one of us. Verse 19, now, after having said all that, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. We are all under the law. We have all become guilty before God. Our mouths are shut. Guilty. Guilty is charged. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law came to reveal to us our condition, our helplessness and our hopelessness. But it also came for another reason. And here's your but God. In verse 21. You go from verse 20 into verse 21, but God. You can write that right out there, right across that verse, right out beside of that verse, whatever you want. But God. That's what it says. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all of them that believe, for there is no difference. How did you get the righteousness of God? By faith. Through Jesus Christ. By the faith of Jesus Christ. Verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It is by grace. Faith is by grace. Faith in the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. It is by faith. It is grace. Amen. God gives you the faith to believe yes. in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ whom God has set forth to be, that is, Jesus Christ, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. That is, through faith in his blood, God has said that if you believe in the blood sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, the redemption that is in that, then my wrath against you shall be appeased. And our wrath was appeased in Jesus Christ 
on the cross of Calvary was made real to us, was made manifest to us when we believed. And we didn't believe until he gave us the grace. And when he gave us the grace to believe, repentance and faith came. And we believed. To declare his righteousness, not ours, his righteousness, for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. He is the just one, and he is the justifier of those that believe because he gives them the grace to believe, and then he justifies them. <laughs> Where's boasting then? In a couple of weeks, we're going to come back to this when we hit verse 9 in Ephesians 2. Where's boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Faith takes away boasting. You can't even boast. Well, I had the faith. No, you didn't. You didn't have the faith till God gave it to you. See why I said it? if I was an Armenian, by the time I got done reading this passage of Scripture, I wouldn't be an Armenian no more. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. How does it establish the law? Faith in Jesus Christ, the one who fulfilled the law, the one who kept, kept the law in every point. As a man, he did it. And he died on the cross of Calvary, taking my sins there. Not, he didn't suffer the wrath of God for his sins. He had no sin. He suffered the wrath of God for me. So he even meet, met the demands of the law, which were the demands of a righteous and just God, pouring out his wrath upon sin. And he poured it out upon his son on the cross of Calvary so that Seth born could have eternal life. Throw away that chapter division. He's not done saying what he's got to say. What shall we say then? How do we get this righteousness? How, do we get, how did we get rid of sin? How's our sins gone? How do we get this righteousness? He's going to tell you now. How did faith do this? He told us there in the third chapter it was by faith. But how did that translate to, to our sins being gone and righteousness, the righteousness of God being applied to us? What shall we say then? That Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It was what? It was what? It was credited. It was imputed. It was applied to his account. Underline that word counted. 
Underline the word reckoned. Underline the word imputive. Every place you see it, they're the same Greek word. It means credited. You know what credited means? I know what credited means. You get your bank account credited, that's a good thing. I love to get my bank account credited. We just changed banks, went to another bank on a promo. And the condition of the promo was have one direct deposit in the account within 60 days on a recurring monthly deal and they give you $300. We had two direct deposits hit there, going to occur every month, and it occurred in the 57th day. On the 58th day, they credited my account, bank account, $300. That was the easiest $300 I ever made. Abraham believed God and it was credited unto him for righteousness. That was a good thing. <laughs> His account got credited, the righteousness of God. Well, let's go on. Now to him that worketh is the reward not credited of grace, but of debt. I work for it. Give me my pay. Brother Jesse goes up to the house doors and knocks on the door. I did the work, now give me my pay. I used to do that at Walmart. I used to do that at the, the uh, factory I worked in Washington. I put in the work, now I want my pay. <laughs> you guys do it too. We understand that. But to him that worketh not, didn't do nothing for it. But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted, credited for righteousness. So not only Abraham, but all those like Abraham who have faith, who believe God, the righteousness of God is credited to them. Wow. <laughs> That's a good deal. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth, crediteth righteousness without works. Places it to your account without works. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. God doesn't see them anymore. They're where? They're under the blood. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not credit sin. To the man that believes he is credited righteousness and he is not credited sin. That's wiped out. Where is it? Under the blood. Under the blood. It was on Jesus. My sin was on Jesus on the cross of Calvary. It's under the blood. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was credited to Abraham for righteousness. How was then it then reckoned? How was it then credited? Get this. When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision. When was it? Well, circumcision wasn't given until the 17th chapter of Genesis. In the 15th chapter of Genesis, 
God made the statement that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Abraham had faith back in the 12th chapter of Genesis. He believed God. He believed the promise of God. He believed the promise of God concerning his physical seed. He believed the promise of God concerning his spiritual seed. You're going to see that as we continue to read this fourth chapter. He believed both. And he left the Ur the Chaldees. He said goodbye to mom and dad. And to all his friends there in Ur the Chaldees. Good riddance, you ungodly heathen. And he journeyed, as we saw this morning, to a land that he had never seen. Didn't know where it was. In the latter part of the 12th chapter, his faith faltered a little bit. And he journeyed down into Egypt because he's a little bit of weak faith. Not, a, not unlike us. We're just like that. But then in the 13th chapter, he comes up out of Egypt. His faith is strong again. And he says to Lot, you take the high road or the low road, and I'll take the other road. And Lot said, huh, the low road looks pretty good to me. It's pretty rich and fertile. I can, I can prosper greatly there. And so he took the low road, and Abraham took the high road. Abraham believing that God would be with him all the while. And in the 14th chapter of, uh, of Genesis, Abraham's faith is strong, so strong that he goes out and he delivers Lot and the Sodomites from the hand of Chedorlaomer. And he won't take anything from the Sodomites lest they say they made Abraham rich. And he paid tithes unto the high priest of the Most High God, Melchizedek. And we come to the 15th chapter. And God's reiterating His promise to him. And he believed God and God makes the statement that it was counted unto him for righteousness. Well, we come to the 16th chapter of Genesis. His faith begins to falter a little bit again. Just like us. Well, God, what am I going to do? My wife's past the age of childbearing. Her womb's dried up. You want my help? We'll help you out, God. And he's been paying for it ever since. And we have a long spell between Genesis 17 and Genesis 18. A spell of about 12, 13 years. Think about that. No word from God. No record concerning Abram. But then God appears to him. And he reveals himself as the Almighty, as El Shaddai. He said, walk thou before me and be thou perfect. And your name will be no longer Abram, but Abraham. For a father of many nations shall I make you. And your wife, Sarai, shall no longer be Sarai, but Sarah. For she shall be a mother of many. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So it was not in circumcision but in uncircumcision when his faith was counted, credited 
for righteousness. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith. You see, that's all circumcision was, was a sign, was a seal of the relationship between him and God and his seed and God. Baptism is the white figure. It identifies the people of God with Jesus Christ. I have a message on circumcision, the like work of ba ba or baptism, the like work of circumcision. A parallel there. They're both <laughs> works of the flesh, but they both pictured something. You see. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. See, there's the spiritual seed. He is our father, our spiritual father. We're in the spiritual lineage of Abraham by virtue of Jesus Christ came from Abraham. And we're in Christ. Makes us the seed of Abraham. Let's read on. The righteousness might be imputed, credited unto them also that believe. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised. It mattered not that you're not a Jew. Even a Gentile, if he's a believer in Jesus Christ, is the seed of Abraham. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. You see, <laughs> get that. Let me read that again, verse 13. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. <laughs> You go back there, and, and that promise in, in Genesis chapter 12, do you see the spiritual connotation now? The spiritual seed of Abraham. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. In other words, if you through the keeping of the law have become heirs, rightful heirs, then is faith made of none effect. It's not of grace. It's of works. It's of debt. It's old you. <laughs> because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith, get this, that it might be by grace. That verse just told you that faith is by grace. Faith is the gift of God. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, might be sure to all of us who claim to be the seed of Abraham, the spiritual seed, Amen. by virtue of faith. Amen. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith, of Abraham, who is the father of us all, Jew or Gentile, don't, matters not. If you're a believer, he's your father. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. How could it be the father of many nations? He could be the father of a nation, but how could it be the father of many nations if it didn't go beyond his physical seed? 
And it went beyond this physical seed by faith to everyone who is a child of faith, you see. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform, being fully persuaded. Are you fully persuaded tonight? In other words, do you have faith? Faith is to be fully persuaded. Persuaded in what? The Word of God. And therefore it was imputed, it was credited to him for Righteousness. That is, righteousness was placed to his account. Sin's gone. It was in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. It's now under the blood. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, credited to him. It wasn't written only for his sake. We're not being told that here in the fourth chapter of Romans only for Abraham's sake, but we're being told it for our sake as well, if you're a believer. But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, credited, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again, for our justification. Are you a believer? Do you believe? Do you have faith in Jesus Christ? If you do, the righteousness of God is credited to your account. The sins are gone. They're under the blood of Jesus Christ. We have complete salvation. who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. We have complete, just, uh, complete salvation. If you don't think so, read it in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. We're even glorified. Past tense. It's done. <laughs> even though we haven't realized it yet, it is sure. Just as God is sure. And his word cannot fail. You see, God owes us nothing. He owed us nothing. But he gives us complete salvation. What a deal that is. <laughs> I didn't deserve it. You didn't deserve it. If you're here and unsaved tonight, if you're here and an unbeliever, you don't deserve it. But if you can believe, God gives it to you. And it's credit. His righteousness is credited to your account. Sin's gone, as we've said so many times already tonight. Sin's gone in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Your sins are under the blood. Folks, that's grace. That's grace. I don't know why the Armenians want to rob, rob us of grace. You see? And make it a works. Hey, well, let's stand. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer.